Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Larry, and the whole group there at Liberty Hall, the team of volunteers who are making this happen. And I also want to thank Barb and the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. I am greatly honored to uh, been asked to give the Joseph III Peace Lecture. I have a great admiration and respect for Joseph Smith III. When he was ordained to the office of prophet and president at a general conference of Midwestern Latter-day Saints in 1860, his new organization actually claimed only a few hundred members. But by the time he died half a century later, membership in the reorganized church had grown to 72,000 or more. And Joseph III had successfully imprinted many characteristics of his character, his integrity, his pragmatism, his vision on the church. And so this um, accomplishment all by itself in my book makes him rank among the restoration in general, the entire Latter-day Saint movement's most successful leaders. Joseph III's biographer, Roger Launius, attributes much of the prophet's success to his pragmatism. So he called his biography, Joseph III, a pragmatic prophet. Roger writes, a man of principle and a man of conviction. Joseph Smith III was also a man of practicality who recognized above all the nature and uses of power to accomplish worthy goals. And he saw the necessity of patience and compromise. In the reorganized church's history, his course was the supreme example of the union of principle and pragmatism. He moved as swiftly towards his goals as his followers and the world at large would allow. So if we just take a second and look at the timeline of the Latter-day Saint movement of the Community of Christ, uh, broken down by the tenure of each of the prophet presidents, it's actually a little bit surprising always how few there have been because how long the administration of each has been. But even in a uh, constellation of leaders who have uh, had decades long um, tenure, Joseph III's 54 years kind of stands out on this chart. And as a result of that, in this really important time too, at the beginning of the reorganization of the church after the interregnum, this period of disorganization, he was able to set the norms of the prophetic office, essentially set how the organization work, what it means to be a prophet and president, and as a result, set the direction of the church in a ways and legacies that continue all the way to this day in the 21st century. So among those legacies to the church includes community of Christ's focus on peace. And so uh, the fact that the peace lecture is named in Joseph Smith III's honor and is sponsored by Liberty Hall here is very appropriate because of Joseph Smith III's focus. That has still remained in Community of Christ, both one of our five mission initiatives and one of our nine enduring principles. The only one, uh, the only concept that is really shared among both of those uh, duplicated precisely. In his survey of the peace tradition within the history of Community of Christ, Apostle Lachlan Mackay concluded, quote, an RLDS peace gene has been isolated and it resides in the nucleus of Joseph Smith III. In other words, there were attempts at peace in the early church, in the early church tradition. Nevertheless, in the early church tradition, there was also um, taking up arms uh, there were multiple conflicts, even wars, uh, and so on. Joseph III redirected that and brought us to the place we are today. Much of my work in the history of the Latter-day Saint movement has been charting schism and division. So we both have looked at all of the schisms that took place within the movement prior to 1844 the surviving branches that emerged in the movement out of the 1844 succession crisis at the death of the founder, Joseph Smith Jr. So the 
those branches that have continued all the way to this day, the large Brighamite branch, our own Josephite branch, and then the smaller Bickertonite, Hedrickite, Strangite, and Cutlerite branches are all still uh, alive and with us. And then also we look at the subsequent divisions within those branches, including, for example, fundamentalist breaks from both the LDS and RLDS churches. And so, for example, out of the succession crisis here, we can chart the different uh, directions, different leaders uh, took followers as they created their own church organizations and factions, uh, the largest being the 12 and later reorganized under Brigham Young after 1847 out in the West. And within the Midwest, the largest being James Strang's organization in Wisconsin and Michigan. So when I make these charts and things like that, sometimes people despair a little. They're saying, is the entire history of our movement, is it entirely about division? Isn't there a period in the Restoration history where the saints come back together? And actually, the biggest success story in regathering scattered saints is in fact Joseph Smith III and his work in the reorganization. So after 1860, many Latter-day Saints, many members who had joined the various competing rival organizations, so for example, the Williamites were almost entirely absorbed into the reorganizations, other groups like the Whiteites, Thompsonites, Brooksites, Adamsites, so in other words, they joined in such numbers that they are now extinct. And indeed, many of the other groups also provided lots of members to the reorganization. In general, a very successful um, regathering as opposed to the schisms that normally are happening in the movement. So in order to accomplish all this, Joseph III actually had a number of advantages as of the 1860s. He'd been held, dealt a very good hand, and this included the ill health and death of a number of the competing earlier faction leaders, or um, the breakup of their movements for various reasons and the dissolution of their headquarters organizations. So for example, if we pass by Brigham Young, who was still alive and still quite successful in the 1860s, Lyman White, who'd led a group to Texas, had died very recently. James J. Strang on Beaver Island had been um, wounded and he went back to Voree where he was killed, where he died from his wounds. Charles Thompson in Iowa, um, his church rebelled against him and uh, ultimately uh, sued him and dissolved and so forth. Alphaeus Cutler off in Iowa as well was still alive but was in extremely ill health. Zadok Brooks's organization in Kirtland also had dissolved. So in other words, a lot of these were on hard times right when Joseph III is emerging with the new organization in 1860. But he had other things going for him too. In addition to the demise of his many rivals, Joseph III had the advantage of being his father's eldest son, sharing his father's name, and he was also um, widely understood to have been the prophesied successor. So on numerous occasions, church founder Joseph Smith Jr. prophesied that his son would one day succeed him. And indeed, he gave Joseph III special blessings to that effect, including uh, at very dire times at the end of the Missouri-Mormon War, while his father was incarcerated at Liberty Jail and may have been facing execution. And again, in similarly dire straits, right before he uh, surrendered to Illinois state authorities in Anavu and went to Carthage. He, the last, one of his last major acts was to give, again, Joseph III another such blessing. So most of the factional leaders actually acknowledged that Joseph III was his father's appointed heir, and even Brigham Young said such things to that effect on multiple occasions. Lyman White witnessed the blessing Joseph Jr. gave his son while incarcerated in Liberty Jail. And so even though White led a very successful uh, Mormon colony in Texas, he nevertheless didn't claim leadership for himself, but taught that Joseph III would eventually lead the church. And indeed, when White died and Joseph III did uh, claim the prophetic mantle, most of the Whiteites joined the reorganization. Similar thing happened in the Strangite church. 
So in the Midwest or in the United States, a majority of Latter-day Saints actually affiliated with James J. Strang, who, as I mentioned, was assassinated in 1856. When that happened, one of the leading Strang at Apostles, Lorenzo Dowhickey, uh, started telling the story that Strang had secretly ordained Joseph III as his successor. And even though Joseph III rejected that that ever happened, and he also rejected all of Strang's works, the vast majority of Strangites ended up affiliating with the reorganization on the basis of testimony like this that the Strangite successor should be Joseph III. The Book of Mormon also promoted the idea that the Smith family had an august lineage, as it explains that they are descendants of the biblical patriarch Joseph of Egypt. And in the founder Joseph Smith Jr.'s lifetime, the office of the presiding patriarch evangelist of the church was established for Joseph Smith Sr. and also then transmitted by lineage to Hiram. Joseph III's uncle William Smith popularized the idea of lineal succession um, in partly, and actually mostly as a self-serving uh, uh, claim as he was trying to promote his own succession as a member of the family. So after affiliating with and being ultimately rejected by both Brigham Young's organization and James Strang's organization, William Smith organized his own church, which had headquarters in Palestine Grove, Illinois, and Covington, Kentucky. And while William publicly disclaimed polygamy, as he called it in public, he privately practiced celestial marriage, as he called it, with women and girls, unfortunately, in his organization. And as we'll see, in this, he was actually following the policy of his deceased brothers before in Nauvoo before their deaths. So just to go, just to continue though with the Williamite organization, so caught practicing celestial marriage with an underage church member, William fled the state of Illinois and uh, was excommunicated by his own church. Jason Briggs, who had been ordained an apostle in William's church, along with other Williamites, renounced William's leadership. They became very strong opponents of polygamy from their experience with William Smith, and they uh, received revelation and also vowed to wait for one of the sons of Joseph Smith Jr. to assume the prophetic mantle by right of lineal succession to priesthood. So in other words, this idea of lineal succession is one of the things that was around and was an advantage for Joseph III in his own ministry. The Williamite Church um, in many ways provided the initial vehicle for the new organization that became the reorganized church. So Isaac Sheen, down in Kentucky, who had been the had edited William Smith's newspaper, which was called the Melchizedek and Aaronic Herald, he also caught William practicing polygamy and broke with William over it. Anyway, Isaac Sheen became the first editor of the New Organization's newspaper in 1860, which Sheen continued to call the Herald, just like it had been called in William's church. So the April 6, 1860 General Conference took place in Amboy, Illinois, the new railroad town that replaced the nearby village of Palestine Grove, the other former headquarters of the Williamite Church. So I just want to kind of emphasize here that the new organization had a lot of continuity with Williams Church, which was very focused on the idea of lineal succession and because of Williams' bad example, very opposed to polygamy. So this is a map that kind of shows the scattered saints, at least in the immediate Midwestern zone, centered around the Nauvoo uh, last failed colony of the church. You can kind of see there also William Smith at Palestine Grove, Al Amboy, Isaac Sheen down in Covington, and the other different uh, gathering places of the different factional leaders. So each of the groups that Joseph III needed to appeal to had different experiences in different doctrines in this actually long interregnum period of 1840 to 1860. So because they had had prophets of their own in many cases, the Strangites, for example, following James Strang, 
had become Seventh-day Sabbatarians. So they had moved the day that they worship from Sunday to Saturday. And so this is a pretty big difference as you were kind of trying to bring Latter-day Saints together. Different ones had different focuses as a result of all of this additional experience. Indeed, I would say the only thing that all of the members of all of these factions had in common was their status as dissenters. So they were the folks who did not uh, follow the headquarters organization that Brigham Young assumed control over, and instead were people who uh, dissented from that and went, to their own, uh, went on their own. So regathering dissenters, herding cats, Joseph III, this is in addition to his various uh, things that six things that he was dealt that were very positive. This was a complicated thing in terms of the overall uh, mathematics of the task that he had at hand to create a reorganization successfully. How did he do it? So in bringing together members from diverse factions of the church, Joseph III presented a vision that rolled the clock back further than just those 16 years of disorganization. So there had also been a lot of controversy in the Nauvoo and indeed the Missouri Mormon War era and so forth. And so he rolled it back before that. There had been an enormous outpouring of the spirit that accompanied the dedication of Kirtland Temple. The only temple, by the way, that the founder, Joseph Smith Jr., saw completed. And Joseph III really sought to instill that same positive spirit among the old saints that were regathering into the reorganization. Old members like William Marks remarked, this is the place now where I finally again felt that old Latter-day Saint spirit. So one of the ways that um, Joseph III was able to successfully do that was having to eliminate more recent practices uh, practices that were important to some of his members, but controversial and opposed by others of his members. And so, for example, uh, Seventh-day Sabbatarianism, that was something that a lot of Strangites felt very strongly about, but everybody else was like, no, we, we meet on Sunday, and so forth. So we had to roll those things back. And so this is an example of his pragmatism. So, for example, with the Book of Abraham, this is a text that Joseph Jr. published in the Nauvoo Times and Seasons, and so many of the different Latter-day Saint groups considered it to essentially be scripture, and they wanted it affirmed as one of the church's standard works, canonized scripture. Joseph III kind of responded to this question of canonization that, well, this isn't really a priority. Let's table this for now. Let's work on things that are more important, and then year after year after year, at a certain point, the older member who had been really the big pusher of the Book of Abraham, passed away, and now no one's talking about the Book of Abraham anymore. And so this was a, a pragmatic way that Joseph III uh, approached union. Another approach was his, uh, another, uh, another uh, topic that, that um, illustrates his pragmatic approach is the idea of gathering. So gathering together to build up Zion had been pretty much the central focus of Latter-day Saintism in the first 14 years of the church, and indeed for the uh, subsequent factions in the next 16 years. But Joseph III, who came of age in the failed ghost town of Nauvoo, this place of so much hope that had become a place of you know, really uh, failure, place where his father had been assassinated and he had to live with the um, assassins and so forth as neighbors, Joseph III correctly identified gathering as a source of external opposition. Whatever the saints' motives it were in coming together, uh, it seemed as a threat to their neighbors. Joseph III therefore resisted calls by old saints in the reorganization to name a new gathering place, which they wanted to have right away in 1860. And indeed, when he finally did kind of authorize uh, having a, a, a order of Enoch, a shared uh, colony where people could farm together and, and so forth, build up Zion, uh, it was named Lamoni after the pacifist king from the Book of Mormon to assure that uh, the saints' intentions are peaceful. 
And Joseph III made it explicitly optional to gather there. So in other words, the commandment to gather there was not, uh, it was not it's something you could choose to do or not. I think Joseph III's approach to Revelation was similarly pragmatic. So Revelation in the Bible does not usually come actually from the leader of Let's say it's not from the king, usually, the leader of the community of the church. Rather, it is some, a prophet who is outside the power structure, who is calling the king to repentance or speaking against um, uh, injustices that are happening in the society. It's a very different thing to be the prophet and president. And so Joseph III, I think, um, used revelation in a very pragmatic way and set the tone for how all presidents of the church have, uh, uh, have followed in that tradition in community of Christ. So an example, black men were banned from priesthood ordination in Brigham Young's church. And Joseph III prayed for divide guidance on the subject in 1865. So really uh, soon after the Civil War where um, the United States had fought a war over slavery, and he dictated this response. It is my will that my gospel shall be preached to all nations in every land, that all men of every tongue shall minister before me. Therefore, it is expedient in me that you ordain priests unto me of every race who receive the teachings of my law and become heirs according to the promise. So, the effect, therefore, of that revelation is progressive, allowing for the ordination of black men more than a century before the LDS church revoked its own racist priesthood ban. But Joseph III's revelation also sought to reassure perhaps wary conservatives in his flock. So unfortunately, the revelation goes on to add be not hasty in ordaining men of the Negro race to offices in my church, for verily I say unto you, all are not acceptable unto me as servants. Nevertheless, I will that all may be saved, but every man in his own order. And there are some who are chosen instruments to be ministers to their own race. A uh, verse that um, justified for many years uh, segregationist or apartheid policies of priesthood within uh, the reorganized church. And indeed, we contemplated in our last World Conference, a mission center brought a resolution, should we perhaps uh, remove this uh, um, whole section from the Doctrine and Covenants, um, that was voted down because we want to see all, all of our history and, and we would lose this by, uh, by removing this kind of thing. And actually, we can't make uh, our scriptures perfect because indeed all of our scriptures are actually sort of like this with these different voices in them. Another um, uh, component of Joseph Smith III's successful administration uh, it comes down to his adroit control over church communications. So we mentioned that Isaac Sheen had been the original editor of the Herald. Nevertheless, Joseph III assumed control of all church publications by 1865. So he personally served as the Herald editor, and that allowed him to steer the direction of church communications. Especially in the early years, he invited everyone in the church who could use a pen for the cause of truth to share their ideas. And so, as I say, for the, at the beginning at least, that allowed for relatively open doctrinal debates in the Herald. Uh, certainly way more open than exists now, which is where the Herald is an organ entirely of, of headquarters, and it doesn't have contrary views, but it's kind of all one view. So overall, Joseph III had an amazing success at regathering uh, old saints to the extent that many of the rival organizations either went extinct or uh, are down to just a small remnant as the majority ended up joining the reorganization. So for example, the Whiteites. Nearly all the Whiteites um, who remained in the Restoration joined the reorganization. The church is ex extinct, but we have many descendants of Lyman White in the church. So uh, the recently retired senior president of 70, John White, is a grandson, great, great, great grandson. Likewise, the Cutlerite church, which is down to just a dozen members or less, 
None of those are descendants of Alphaeus Cutler, but we have lots of descendants of Alphaeus Cutler uh, in the church, including my friend Wendy Bachman and so forth. They're all uh, direct descendants. Likewise, the Strangite church has a few hundred members, but most Strangites, much bigger organization, joined the reorganization. Again, there are no descendants of Strang in the Strangite church, but uh, our friends Eliza and Tiona Horning, they're great, great grandchildren of Strang by his plural wife, Elvira Field, and actually I was just meeting uh, descendants from, uh, of Strang in our church from other uh, others of his wives. Another um, point of pragmatism that Joseph III exercised, uh, it recurs about this, his mindful uh, attention to the succession. So his father's failure to anticipate his own demise and lay out a clear process of succession really led to that 1844 schism, the fracture of the church. Joseph III corrected this omission with a pretty clear letter of instruction about what the church should do uh, once he was gone. And that prioritized uh, the idea of the appointment by the prophet, appointment of the prophet by his predecessor, rather than that idea of lineal succession. So Joseph actually considered successors outside the Smith family as his successor. And of these, R.C. Evans, from Toronto, Canada here, who was a member of the First Presidency, uh, was certainly considered to be uh, for that position. Ultimately, Joseph III's choice fell on his son, Fred M. Smith, and I think in hindsight we can see that this was really a much better choice than the very talented but very egotistical R.C. Evans. Fred M., who ultimately proved himself an equally able, able prophet and president of the church, uh, ended up being Joseph Smith's choice, uh, but it didn't have to be because he wasn't emphasizing lineal succession. Securing an effective succession is among the most critical phases in the career of anybody who has essentially a monarchy, and the church's prophetic monarchy is no different. The spring I gave uh, an entire lecture, the William B. Smith lecture, uh, for the John Whitmer Historical Association on the history of the prophetic monarchy and community of Christ that's being published right now in the JWHA journal. Uh, so that also talks about this at length. So in the course of his tenure as prophet president, Joseph III successfully built up the reorganization from a few hundred ex-Williamites and ex-Strangites into a church that by the end of his life was about 15% of the size of the Utah LDS Church. So in other words, 300 to 70,000 or so. And the Mormon Church had grown to be about 400,000 from, it was maybe 80,000 at the time uh, Joseph III took over. So in other words, it's not totally out of the ballpark the way it is today. So today the difference is uh, the community of Christ is 1.5% the size of the Utah LDS Church. So um, he had brought it much closer in range. In sum, Joseph III's life work represents a remarkable success, bringing together old members of compete, from competing factions of the movement with different beliefs, people who are already also dissenters, so herding cats together with a shared vision that also then appealed to new seekers and got them to join in the reorganization. So this was largely accomplished, in my opinion, through his personal integrity, coupled with thoughtful, pragmatic, and politically savvy approach to leadership. Certainly among the most successful leaders in Restoration history and altogether very admirable. Unfortunately, there is one place, in my opinion, where Joseph's pragmatism failed. And this has led to, I think, the most tragic failure of his career. So the position Joseph III adopted regarding his father and polygamy resulted in negative consequences for the history of the entire movement as a whole. And also it has left us in community of Christ with trauma that endures today. So in his inaugural sermon that Joseph III preached in the general conference at Amboy on April 6, 1860, he made his fervent opposition to polygamy clear. So that's great, you know, and this part is fine, in my view. He says, there is but one principle 
by the leaders of any faction of, of this people, or one principle taught by any, or practiced by any, the leaders of any of the factions of this people that I hold in utter abhorrence. That is the principle taught by Brigham Young and those believing in him. So he's opposed to polygamy. But, Joseph III added, I have been told that my father taught such doctrines. I have never believed it and never can believe it. If such things were done, then I believe they were never done by divine authority. I believe my father was a good man, and a good man could never have promulgated such doctrines. So that's actually a nuanced position, and it's, but it's also a problematic position. You know, if such things were done, then I believe they were never done by divine authority. So in Joseph III's view, whoever started it, at least we can say it was not of God, uh, the practice of religious polygyny among the Latter-day Saints. In Joseph's view, though, whoever did start it could not have been a good man. Nevertheless, Joseph expressed his own filial piety. He's a good son, and he believes in his father. He believes his father was a good man. So, unfortunately, the math of this nuanced equation, unfortunately, doesn't add up. So, they were never done by divine authority. Well, this is a theological claim, and it's at the heart of the anti-polygamy faction of the Latter-day Saint movement's position. So all the way back to when polygamy began within the Latter-day Saint movement, a significant proportion of the population was opposed to this happening. And those folks believed that polygamy represented an abuse of authority, that this is not something that is done by revelation, this is not something that is divinely ordained. That's a theological claim, what we believe God is calling us to do or not calling us to do. I believe my father was a good man, a good man could never have, I'm sorry, a good man never could have promulgated such doctrines. So these two positions are Joseph III's personal opinions, and unfortunately, they are in logical contradiction because of the first thing. If such things, there was polygamy, if such things were done, unfortunately, there is a total consensus among all legitimate academically trained historians that Joseph Jr. is the origin, is the originator of Mormon polygamy. So nobody argues that he was not involved at all. So all historians include, if such things were done, they were, that they were done in other words, they were never done by divine authority. You know, Community of Christ agrees with that. I believe my father was a good man, a good man could never have promulgated such doctrines. So whether or not Joseph Smith Jr. was a good man is opinion, but his promulgation of polygamy is a fact, and we'll talk about that. So there is a historical consensus. W. Grant McMurray, to date, is the only RLDS president who has had, who's been academically trained in history. And indeed, he began his church employment as the assistant church historian to Richard Howard, and Richard Howard was himself the first official historian of the church to have actually been academically drained in history. So before that, um, we had historians who were antiquarians, people who were interested in history, but who uh, were not trained in the historical method and so forth. They were doing good work, but that wasn't necessarily going to produce academically sound results. In 2006, Grant addressed the annual conference of the John Whitmer Historical Association. In the course of that address, he put things in the forms of a, a list of dids and did nots to say who did what and so forth in the past, as he's answering his understanding of history, both as a past president of the church and also as a historian who'd researched this. And he wrote, I want to identify some things we need to say, we as a church, Community of Christ, need to say so as to free ourselves from mistaken ideas that can deter us from effectively moving into the future. And among those is, Joseph and polygamy did. So Joseph Smith is involved in the beginnings of Mormon polygamy. He's, McMurray writes, I thought this battle, this is in 2000, 
and six he writes this. I thought this battle had finally been won a decade or two ago, but it reared its ugly head again recently. Our handling of it as a church was not distinguished. I don't think we'll ever fully know the extent of Joseph Smith's involvement in the introduction and practice of polygamy. However, no credible historian is arguing today that he had no involvement whatsoever. That is, almost 20 years ago, Grant McMurray, the church's past president, stated that he agreed with all credible historians that Joseph Smith Jr. participated in polygamy and he thought that the facts had generally been acknowledged by most church members as of the 1980s or the 1990s. But um, people listening to me right now, there are many of you who are saying, I don't believe that, that's not what I believe, who are members of this church. And so there are people listening to me right now in this lecture who are not aware that the historical evidence is, in this question is conclusive. So we've been learning this all the way back to the first times anybody in the church um, did receive academic training in history. So Bob Flanders, Robert Flanders, one of the very earliest um, uh, RLDS members to have a history degree already in 1965 published monumental book, Nauvoo, Kingdom on the Mississippi River, who concluded essentially the evidence on this question was conclusive. So if you're listening and you were taught that Joseph Smith Jr. did not participate in polygamy, I want to say nobody in the church was lying to you. They are telling you, they were telling you what they had been told and they were telling you that in good faith. So Joseph III's sons, for example, Fred M. Smith, Israel A. Smith, W. Wallace Smith, believed Joseph III's testimony, and they didn't hear the nuance embedded in that formula that I read you at a lot of length. If such things were done, they were never done by divine authority. Instead, they just believed their father's testimony. It didn't happen. And they are not witnesses to that, and they were not historians. They were teaching things as fact. They were teaching beliefs about the past, though, that were not, in fact, historically accurate. So I want to just give a little bit of this evidence. It's impossible to go through it all because it is, it, it's, so, it's a mass, massive. It's, it's more than you can imagine on almost any historical question. So, um, and this was illustrated by, uh, again, the first academically trained church historian, Dick Howard, all the way back in the early 80s when he published kind of a monumental uh, historiographical uh, um, survey uh, on uh, Joseph Smith and polygamy, um, which you can see Grant McMurray here, who was either still his assistant or who had been called at this point into the first presidency as they're planning the sesquicentennial. Um, this is when Grant was presumably thinking, well, we've, we've settled this by now. <laughs> but anyway, it hadn't been. So there are a bunch of different types of evidence for Joseph Smith's practical, uh, practice of polygamy. And I'm going to put them here into two circles. So we have primary accounts that are written or published in Joseph Smith's life. So in other words, things that people wrote and said already while he was alive. And we have a lot of that. And then we have primary accounts. So people who are still eyewitnesses, people who knew Joseph Smith directly or, or participating directly, and that these are accounts that they either wrote or they uh, swore affidavits or court testimony and so forth after his death. So in the old days, when we were not historians, we were not following academically trained uh, history in Community of Christ in the RLDS church, the only evidence we were willing to look at were insiders who were loyal to Joseph Smith during Joseph Smith's life and who also followed Joseph Smith III after 1860. In other words, if you are RLDS, then we're going to listen to you and we're, not going, to, we're going to just not listen to everybody else in the entire movement. Um, that is certainly what you can do as a partisan, but it's not something that you can do as an academic historian. That's not how we need to listen to both positive and negative evidence. So, for example, since Brigham Young led the largest faction of the church, that includes the largest number of witnesses. But obviously, those insiders, both what they wrote during Joseph Smith's lifetime and afterwards, 
that has to be read in light of the fact that they have a pro-Brigham Young bias. So in the past, before we were academic historians, we just ignored it all and said those guys are liars or whatever. Now we need to look at it, but be aware that they are biased, just like our own members were biased. Nevertheless, there's a significant number of people who are very positive to Joseph Smith, but who were very antagonistic to Brigham Young, who were again giving this amazing amount of evidence that Joseph Smith was a polygamist, and it doesn't really explain why that should be. So in other words, if Brigham Young had founded it, and these guys all hate Brigham Young, uh, why is everybody who is not in the reorganization, and actually lots of people who were in the reorganization, why are they also all saying this? It was Our old narrative was really never able to explain this very well. And obviously we also have insiders who broke with Joseph Smith and left the movement. Once again, um, people like Oliver Cowdery and William Law are no big fans of Brigham Young, there's no particular reason why, if Brigham Young had started all of this, that they would also um, uh, attribute uh, this correctly to Joseph Smith. Um, obviously, we have to read their later anti-Joseph Smith bias. So uh, Oliver Cowdery had a big fight with Joseph Smith. William Law had a big fight with Joseph Smith and so forth. But it's not because they are in cahoots with Brigham Young and so forth. So we have all of this kinds of evidence, and there's an amazing amount of it. So let's just look at a little bit of it because we do not have time to, um, you know, it, you can't have an entire uh, thing this tie of all the documentary evidence, but just uh, different kinds of this evidence. So William Law, writing during Joseph Smith's lifetime, he was, had been a member of the Nauvoo First Presidency. He swore this affidavit in 1844. He said, I hereby certify that Hiram Smith did in his office read to me a certain written document which he said was a revelation from God. He said that he was with Joseph when he received it. He afterwards gave me the document to read and I took it to my house and read it and showed it to my wife and returned it the next day. The revelation so-called authorized certain men to have more wives than one at a time in this world and in the world to come. It was said this was the law and commanded Joseph to enter into the law and he also should administer to others uh, the same. So in rebuffing William Law in his lifetime, it is true that Joseph Smith would make public denials uh, of polygamy. Um, and he did so, though, in such a way where he is essentially technically trying not to perjure himself. So he'll say things like this in public. This new holy prophet, William Law, now, William Law has left the church and has founded a reformed Mormon church that is trying to get polygamy out of the church, has gone to Carthage and swore that I told him I was a guilty of adultery. The spiritual wifeism, why a man does not speak or wink for fear of being accused of this. What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. And so he's only looking around, he's, not, he's only seeing, he's doing, saying all of these things. It's not adultery because, um, because he doesn't consider it to be adultery because he has had a revelation that it, it says it's not, an adult, it, not adulterous and so forth. Uh, and so he uses other words uh, like polygamy and spiritual wifeism here to suggest that there is something going on that is not the true celestial marriage uh, that he's actually practicing. So the point of it is that the church had a policy of secrecy. Uh, which we know from uh, every single kind of insider witness, Smith taught the doctrine secretly and swore those in the know to secrecy. And he did this because if the secret, uh, I'm sorry, because the secret continually got out, Joseph also issued these public denials, which he felt were technically true, where he's nudge, nudge, wink, winking, he even says wink. <laughs> Uh, while they nevertheless intended to deceive. So he would denounce polygamy because he privately was practicing the principle of celestial marriage. So polygamy and spiritual wifery were the devil's counterfeit to the true principle, uh, which is not um, adulterous in, in any way, is his, in his opinion. So even though those are the public statements, we nevertheless do have from Joseph Smith's lifetime correspondence from him and other writings that illustrate that he viewed this in a very different manner. So uh, according to her 1869 affidavit, 
Sarah Ann Whitney was sealed to Joseph Smith in 1842 when she was 17 by her father, uh, Newell K. Whitney, Whit Newell K. Whitney, who was then the presiding bishop of the church. So by this time, Joseph had already been sealed to more than a dozen women and girls. Three weeks after the sealing, while Joseph was hiding from the Missouri sheriffs, he wrote Sarah Ann uh, and her parents this letter in his own handwriting. And so we have this still. I take this opportunity to communicate some of my feelings privately at this time, which I want you three eternally to keep in your own bosoms, for my feelings are so strong for you, since what has passed lately between us, that the time of my absence from you seems so long and dreary that it seems as if I could not live long in this way. And if you three would come and see me in this lonely retreat, it would afford me great relief of mind, if with those whom I am ailed do love me. Now it is time to afford me succor in the days of my exile, for you know I foretold you of these things. I am now at Carlos Granger's, just back of Brother Hiram's farm. It is only one mile from town. The nights are very pleasant indeed. All three of you can come and see me in the forepart of the night. Let Brother Whitney come a little ahead and knock at the east corner of the house at the window. It is next to the cornfield. I have a room entirely by myself. The whole matter can be attended to in the most perfect safety. I know it is the will of God that you should comfort me now in this time of affliction, or not at all. Now is a time or never, but I have no need of saying any such thing to you, for I know the goodness of your hearts and that you will do the will of the Lord when it is made known to you. The only thing that I can be careful of is to find out when Emma comes, then you cannot be safe. But when she is not here, there is the most perfect safety. Only be careful to escape observation as much as possible. I know it is a heroic undertaking, but so much the greater friendship and the more joy. When I see you, I will tell you all my plans. I cannot write them on paper. Burn this letter as soon as you read it. Keep all locked in your breasts. My life depends on it. Only one thing uh, I want to see for you is to get the fullness of my blessings sealed upon our heads, and you will pardon me for my earnestness on this subject. When you consider how lonesome I must be, your good feelings know how to make every allowance for me. I close my letter. I think Emma won't come tonight. If she don't, don't fail to come tonight. I subscribe myself your most obedient and affectionate companion and friend, Joseph Smith. So in addition to the letter that we have in Joseph's hand, which is a little bit circumspect, but I don't think it's that circumspect <laughs> about this uh, tryst that he wants to have uh, when Emma's not around, he also doc dictates what he is called a revelation here prior to his sealing with Sarah Ann, where her father, Newell K. Whitney, the presiding bishop, acted as a scribe. He writes, Verily thus saith the Lord unto my servant, Newell K. Whitney, the thing that my servant Joseph has made known unto you and your family, which you have agreed upon, is right in my eyes and shall be rewarded upon your heads with honor and immortality and eternal life to all your house, both old and young. Because of the lineage of my priesthood, saith the Lord, it shall be upon you and your children after you from generation to generation by virtue of the holy promise, which I now make unto you, saith the Lord. These are the words which you shall pronounce upon my servant Joseph and your daughter Sarah and Whitney, that they shall take each other by hand and you shall say, you both mutually agree, calling on them by name, to be each other's companion so long as you both shall live, preserving yourselves for each other and for all others throughout eternity also, reserving only those rights which have been given to my servant Joseph by revelation and commandment and by legal authority in times past. If you both agree and covenant to this, then I give you, Sarah Ann Whitney, my daughter, to Joseph Smith, to be his wife, to observe all of the rights between you that belong to that condition. I do it in my own name, in the name of my wife, your mother, in the name of my holy progenitors, by right of the birth, which is the priesthood, vested in me by revelation and commandment and promise of the living God, obtained by the holy Melchizedek Jethro and all the other holy fathers, commanding in the name of the Lord those powers to concentrate in you and through your posterity forever. All these things I do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through this order he may be glorified and through the power of anointing David may reign king over Israel, which shall hereafter be revealed. Let immortality and eternal life hereafter be sealed upon your heads forever and ever. So this um, 
same kind of sealing, the same kind of heavenly dynastic promise, the idea that Newell K. Whitney and his family would be sealed now through this dynastic relationship of the celestial marriage between Newell K. Whitney's daughter and Joseph Smith. That would have been the same kind of promise that Joseph Smith would have made to my great, 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 great grandparents around this same time, Stephen and Nancy Winchester, when he asked them and they gave him their 14-year-old daughter, Nancy Mariah Winchester, to him to be a plural wife. And so I just mentioned all of this about the Whitneys as, a, as evidence. We have evidence for, like I say, about 27, very good evidence for at least 20, 27 of the women. So these are very well documented. We have a lot of evidence. We just have read it here in Joseph Smith's own words. Other evidence by witnesses that remained loyal to Joseph Smith include entries by his official secretary, William Clayton, where he is recording Joseph Smith engaging in this through his regular day-to-day -day activities. So while the Whitneys and Clayton later followed Brigham Young, many of the other opponents are very much against Brigham Young. So for example, contemporary loyalist insider information is concerned, confirmed by all kinds of exposés by insiders who left. So Nauvoo Mayor John C. Bennett, certainly a bad guy. For a while though, he was Smith's best friend. He had a very questionable character. Nevertheless, he had a lot of good information that is confirmed by all of the other sources that are anti-Bennett and so forth. Like I say, William Law, was continued to be for a while anyway, uh, a great believer in the restoration. He was appalled by Joseph Smith teaching the doctrine of celestial marriage to him. So what about Emma? So with one brief exception, and where she was acting very reluctantly, uh, Emma was an ardent opponent of polygamy and celestial marriage, whatever you want to call it, she was against it. For this reason, Joseph Smith kept his early practice very, very secret from Emma. We read in that letter to the Whitneys, don't come when Emma's around and so forth. Even when he taught her the principle, he deceived her about the extent to which and the practice, the extent of the practice and the number of women that were already involved. So for example, and, and when he did uh, temporarily get her to acquiesce, it was through uh, bringing out all of the guns. So in uh, in July 12, 1843, he dictated a so-called revelation commanding the practice of civil, celestial marriage, and it included very specific threats, divine threats, to Emma. And so the so-called polygamy revelation, canonized in the Utah LDS Church, says, Let mine handmaid, Emma Smith, receive all those wives that have been given unto my servant Joseph, for I am the Lord thy God, and ye shall obey my voice. And I give unto my servant Joseph that he shall be made ruler over many things, for he hath been faithful over a few things, and from henceforth I will strengthen him. And I command my handmaid, Emma Smith, to abide and cleave unto my servant Joseph and to none else. But if she will not abide by this commandment, I'm sorry, if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God, and I will destroy her if she abide not in my law. So, threatened with destruction, and frankly deceived by her husband as to the extent of the practice, Emperor Emma did temporarily acquiesce and agreed to allow Joseph Smith to be sealed secretly to a few young women before she decided that it was horrible and wrong, and she resumed her opposition to polygamy. Many early RLDS insiders were also very aware of Joseph Smith's practices. So, for example, a number of the people who affiliated with the new organization in 1860 had been leading Nauvoo insiders. First and foremost, William Marks of the RLDS First Presidency, who had been the president of the Standing or Presiding High Council in Nauvoo. Marks had been taught the principle of celestial marriage from Joseph Smith directly, but he testified that Joseph, however, in the last uh, days of his life, became convinced before his death that he had done wrong. And this was the original position of the new organization of the 
reorganization. So in the very first issue of the RLDS Saints Herald, William Marks wrote to Isaac Sheen, the editor of the paper, Brother Sheen, I feel desirous to communicate through your periodical a few suggestions made by the Spirit of God in relation to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. About the 1st of June, 1844, situated as I was at that time, being the presiding elder of the stake of Nauvoo, and by appointment, the presiding officer of the High Council, I had very good opportunity to know the affairs of the church. And my convictions at the time were that the church in a measure had departed from the pure principles and doctrines of Jesus Christ. I felt much troubled in mind about the condition of the church. I prayed earnestly to my father, heavenly father, to show me something in regard to it. When I was wrapped in vision and he showed, it was shown to me by the spirit that the top or branches had come overcome the root in sin and wickedness, and that the only way to cleanse and purify it was to disorganize it, and in due time the Lord would reorganize it again. A few days after this occurrence, I met with Brother Joseph, who said he wanted to converse with me on the affairs of the church, and we retired by ourselves. I will give you his words verbatim, for they are indelibly stamped upon my mind. He had said he desired for a time to have a talk with me on the subject of polygamy. He said it would eventually prove the overthrow of the church, and we should be obliged to leave the United States unless it could be speedily put down. He was satisfied that it was a cursed doctrine, and there must be every exertion made to put it down. He said that he would go before the congregation and proclaim, it, proclaim against it, and I must go to the high council, and he would prefer charges against those in transgression, and I must sever them from the church unless they made ample satisfaction. So. So, in any event, we have from several RLDS insiders like Marx that uh, at the end of his life, Joseph Smith saw that this practice that he'd introduced was a mistake and he wanted to reverse course. It's a course reversal that came too late, but backing up that claim, for example, is Todd Compton, who is a historian who has written uh, the study in Sacred Loneliness, uh, the biographies of all the plural wives of Joseph Smith, Todd Compton has the conclusion that Joseph took no additional wives in the last six months of his life. So he may have been ceasing this practice himself. In addition, Joseph and Emma burned the original document of the polygamy revelation together. Unfortunately, a copy was kept by William Clayton, so that ended up continuing to exist, but the original was burned. And um, Emma, in testimony, here, you know, kind of has testimony to William McClellan, also said that Joseph had told her that the uh, that this was the polygamy was going to ruin the church, and they had to root it out of the church. Finally, Joseph put off his endowment garments, which are associated with the practices of sealing, and he told others to do likewise. And he was not wearing them when he went away to Carthage, where he was assassinated. So, this was the original RLDS position. And by the way, it has the advantage of being historically defensible. Members of the new organization, like William Marks and Isaac Sheen, they had this understanding that Joseph Smith, of Joseph Smith and polygamy. It was tragic, but historically defensible. So they were able to say, like Peter, the apostle, who denied Christ three times, the horrible tragedy for Christ's leading apostle. Joseph Smith had human failings. Like King David, the emblematic king of all of Judah, uh, the stripling warrior that had killed Goliath, that King David also had Uriah the Hittite killed in order to marry Bathsheba. It's just a horrible abuse of his authority, uh, you know, by the biblical in the biblical narrative. He came to regret his actions, uh, King David. So, in other words, this is not a our Figures even biblically are not perfect, but make errors and sometimes uh, repent those errors, sometimes they don't, and sometimes in, in any event, the consequences of their actions uh, can lead also to their deaths. So as, as late as 1865 in the reorganization, a joint council of leaders, the apostles and the presidency together, considered a resolution absolving Joseph Smith Jr. from the practice of polygamy, something that Joseph III wanted to have passed, but they decided that they had to table it 
quote, on the grounds that its passage would be more injurious than good because of the almost universal opinion among the saints that Joseph Smith Sr., I'm sorry, not Sr., Joseph the founder, was in some way connected with the origin of polygamy, the practice of polygamy. So, so they already recognize both that it's the Europe universal opinion among the saints, even in the RLDS church, that Joseph Smith was, had been practicing polygamy, and that if we start saying this thing that he didn't, that's going to be very injurious. That is going to hurt the church by spreading that idea. So how did the RLDS church move away from universal opinion, from awareness of the historical reality to effectively willful ignorance on this issue? So once again, uh, Joseph, all the, all the tools that I showed about how Joseph Smith uh, was successful in what he did, Joseph III, I mean, while how he was successful in his leadership, he was also able to use these to accomplish this particular interest that he had. So for example, Joseph Smith used his control of the Herald to promote his personal inaccurate position. And as a result of that, uh, his control of the Herald, RLDS Apostle Zenas Gurley Jr. wrote to him in 1879, look, I have felt somewhat sore and chagrined at the attempts made through the Herald to establish the innocence of your father touching polygamy. And I may say here that many others in the church have expressed similar feelings to me. So Gurley asks him, will you, put, will you open the columns of the Herald to the other side of the story? And have I not a right as a member of this body to demand it? So Joseph III denied Gurley's requests. And in fact, the Herald's previous policy of relative openness kind of declined into theological censorship where Joseph III decided whether things would be printed or not, and specifically this thing he would not let be printed. So Joseph's new Herald policies and indeed his false acquittals of his father ultimately left, uh, led Jason W. Briggs, who had been the president pro tem of the new organization to resign his membership in 1886. So again, uh, Generally speaking, Joseph III is waiting out old opponents. William Marx is long since dead, Isaac Sheen, uh, and slowly either uh, he waits them out or in some cases uh, they leave. Meanwhile, Joseph III's uncle, William B. Smith, as we saw before in the interregnum period, had not only taught celestial marriage, had been taught celestial marriage by, firsthand by his brother, he had also practiced it in Palestine Grove, which had broken his own church up when, again, he had married, I say married because it's not a legal marriage, the 15-year-old uh, follower, Rosanna Hook. So the ex-Williamites actually gave evidence to Joseph III that his uncle had done that. So Joseph III was very aware that his uncle had practiced polygamy. And the RLDS church treated William very cautiously. Uh, they did not, he was concerned about Joseph William's reputation and character and so forth. So they allowed him to become a member, they allowed him to be a high priest, but they rejected uh, the claims that William had, that he had been one of the original apostles and he should be accepted as an apostle, and that he had been the presiding patriarch of the church and that he uh, was owed that by a lineage. So those, uh, those positions were rejected by Joseph III. Nevertheless, in 1882, Joseph III wrote to his uncle regarding pol polygamy, and he writes, if you are the wise man I think you to be, you will fail to remember anything contrary to the lofty standard of character at which we esteem your brothers, Joseph Jr. and Hiram Smith. So in other words, if you're, as you're writing your memoirs now about Nauvoo and so forth, you better not be remember. I've, I've spent all of this time uh, suggesting or you know, insisting that Joseph and Hiram hadn't practiced polygamy, so you better not remember anything contrary to that. So William Smith got the message. So even though, again, Joseph III knew that he himself, that William had been a polygamist and so forth, William swore false affidavits, that there was no such thing in the church ever, uh, that has, he never heard of it, that it was all Brigham Young and everything like that. And William made regular statements absolving Joseph Smith Jr. of polygamy, and Joseph III was willing to publish those statements, which 
frankly, are no, knowingly publishing falsehoods. So Joseph also uh, published a last testimony of his mother after her death in 1879. So I just want to say this is like one of the things for many of you who might be saying, well, I don't believe that Joseph Smith Jr. was a polygamist, even though all historians agree that he was. And maybe you might be hanging this on this last testimony of Emma. But I want to say also, we don't actually have her perspective written in her own hand. What we have is uh, the interview that her son wrote and what he says she said and published after she died. We also have lots of other things that she said to other people uh, which contradict what she said to Joseph III. So, for example, in a memoir written by William Law, that guy who had been in the First Presidency, who uh, had started a reformed Mormon church, published the Expositor, and so forth, he wrote in his memoir that, uh, that, in, that he talked to Emma in 1843, and that Emma was very much against the polygamy revelation, so in other words, she's aware that it existed, but that she had resigned herself to it. In other words, so he's talking to her at that brief window, and she said to, to him, to William Law, Emma said, I must submit or be destroyed. Well, I guess I have to submit. So you can imagine that that is a response to that so-called revelation that Joseph read to her. Right? So William Law said that she was opposed to polygamy, but she had decided to resign herself to it according to what she said to him. So we have what she said to her son. We also have what she said here to William Law. We also have what she said to other people. So in early 1843, Joseph Smith Jr. secretly married his wards, Eliza Maria Partridge and Emily Dow Partridge, the two daughters of the preceding uh, uh, presiding bishop of the church who had died, uh, Edward Partridge. So again, in the, they were already married to Joseph Smith in celestial marriage anyway, not real marriage. In the brief window when Emma decided that she must submit or be destroyed, um, she was invited to pick wives for Joseph Smith to start this practice. And so she chose Eliza and Emily, not knowing that he'd already secretly wed them. So in 1885, Emily, in recollection, testified that, quote, in order to save the family trouble, Brother Joseph thought it best to have another ceremony performed and accordingly, on the 11th of May, 1843, we were sealed to Joseph Smith a second time in Emma's presence, she giving her free and full consent thereto. Although then she later rejected that and kicked him out of the house and so forth. So in other words, we also have what Emma said to Emily Partridge. Another person that Emma talked to about polygamy is William McClellan. He was one of the original apostles, and he's somebody who was respected by Emma Smith. And so actually, after the reorganization happened, Emma wrote her son and said, well, I think there might still be something. William McClellan might end up joining us. And he was a man of a lot of character and talent. Um, but uh, he did not actually affiliate with the reorganization, but Emma was positively disposed. So in 1872, William McClellan recalled a time that he had stayed in Nauvoo with Emma and the Smith family back in 1847. And so this is after her husband died, when she's still figuring out or thinking what happened, putting things to pieces together. And he says that he interviewed her about all of the various things about polygamy. She wouldn't tell him things or not in some cases, but she'd say yes or no. And so he asked her about the uh, so-called first marriage, Panny Alger, the um, what Oliver Cowdery called a, a, a nasty, dirty affair or whatever. He asked her if that had occurred, if Emma had caught uh, Joseph and Fanny Alger, and Emma confirmed that according to William McClellan, and she also told him that Joseph, her husband, had said the doctrine would ruin the church, just like uh, William Marks said he had told him, and she confirmed to William McClellan that, that Joseph and she had burned the so-called revelation together. So that also is another account of a person who, again, is not a fan of Brigham Young, hates Brigham Young totally, uh, but who also has um, saying what Emma said to him. So all we have in terms of what Emma said is not anything in her own hand, but what she said to different people. So what about the last testimony? So 
lying about polygamy had been her husband's policy. So Joseph Smith Jr. would go and make public statements and say, uh, uh, I'm, I'm opposed to polygamy because, and, I, and, and all adultery and everything like that because he's saying polygamy is different, the devil's counterfeit to celestial marriage, which he's secretly not telling them anybody, but he's secretly practicing. And in his quest to clear his father's name, suborning false testimony had become her son's policy. So Joseph III got his uncle to swear false, knowingly false things. So while Emma may have been in her last testimony speaking in the same kind of nuanced ways uh, that her husband had when she says, for example, that Joseph Smith Jr. quote, had no other wife but me. Well, that's true in a legal sense, because like I've even been saying, these are not real marriages. These are celestial marriages or these are um, secret marriages that Joseph Smith is justifying, whatever you want to call it. And that there was no revelation. Well, she could say that because she doesn't think that document that she burned was a true revelation. <laughs> Nevertheless, her testimony as printed is deceptive uh, because it makes it seem like these are categorical uh, uh, denials when, in fact, uh, the underlying activity did happen. So to conclude, um, I, I, you know, after all of Emma's life's full of suffering, I don't blame her one bit for wanting to forget about polygamy and anything that she said at the end of her life to her son. However, um, for all of the admiration, all of the respect of his integrity generally, all of um, his successes, uh, in my opinion, about Joseph III, his quest to uphold a false image of his father, um, Joseph III's actions in the face of all of the overwhelming he, evidence that he had, I think were at the minimum willfully self-delusional and potentially just outright dishonest. And unfortunately, this obsession that he had, this digging in his heels and forcing this, um, leaves, in my opinion, a black mark on his otherwise admirable character. And it also led to his most serious failures. So Joseph III's biggest failure, ultimately, was his failure to redeem all of the Western saints. I showed how all of the other organizations were on the ropes and, and the leaders had fallen and so forth. In 1860, Brigham Young had also suffered enormous setbacks due to his complicity in the 1857 Mountain Meadows Massacre. This was a nationwide scandal. Uh, prior to this time in the very early settlement of Utah, the US federal government had been willing to work with Brigham Young, make him an Indian agent, give him all kinds of money. After this massacre, after Brigham Young's guilt, at the minimum, as a unindicted felony co-conspirator after the fact, nobody was ever going to trust this guy again. So he had that against him. And while he maintained strong, de facto, dictatorial control over all his followers in Utah, in my view, Brigham Young was ultimately an autocrat, a petty bigot, a bully, a person who was ruling without any legitimacy, and many what Latter-day Saints in the West were prepared to flock to the banner of an effective rival had one emerged. When there are these autocrats, like you need to look at modern times, Vladimir Putin or something like that, they look incredibly powerful while they're in charge and then, and then flip a switch and they could be hiding in a bunker and dead in a second, like happened to Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi and so forth. So by insisting on this faulty position that his father had not originated polygamy, had not participated in polygamy, Joseph III discredited his claim to the prophetic mantle. Everybody was in the know. Everybody knew that that was a false position. What sort of prophet could be so wrong about universally known facts? Prophets are supposed to be discerning. They're supposed to know stuff. If not, if not the future, at least the present. So in my opinion, had Joseph III been less interested in saving his father's reputation and more interested in saving his people, had he been less interested in morally condemning the poor people that were engaged in polygamy and more willing to pragmatically help them find a way out of it, history could have been very different. The reorganization, as successful as it was, failed to absorb its most important rival, and it could have had vastly greater success, if not total success.
So that's an alternate history. We don't know what would have happened had he done that. Uh, nevertheless, his actions have still left community of Christ in need of healing. So Joseph III imprinted many admirable traits on the character of community of Christ, being pragmatic in general, integrity, focus on peace, um, all, you know, all, all kinds of other wonderful components that we have in our DNA. But he also imprinted his failings, and this is his biggest failing. So despite hopes by the presidency two decades ago, Grant McBurry felt that we had maybe collectively accepted the historical reality. I know very well, based on just talking to members who, maybe some of you listening right now, the trauma of polygamy remains embedded in our DNA, and it's still affecting who we are. And so I feel that this is something we need to talk about. This may have been a very controversial topic for a Joseph Smith III Peace Lecture. Um, Again, I'm bringing it as a, from a position not of debunking, but actually out of great admiration for Joseph III and as someone who has committed his entire life to this church. We're in need as a people of healing on this topic. So that is my um, take on Joseph Smith III and what I think was his unpragmatic choice, unpragmatic choice on polygamy. Thank you. I think we will, before we have questions and answers, I think we'll switch to Barbara Walden of the Community Christ Historic Sites Foundation, if I'm correct. That decision is had on the church. Um, at this time, we members of the audience to share any questions that have surfaced during your presentation. Um, and Barbara will be handling that Q&A session. But first, Barbara has some exciting news about upcoming lectures from the Historic Sites Foundation. Barbara? Thank you, Steve. Uh we want to give John a chance to catch his breath after that lecture. And what a great way to fill in that extra time while he's catching his breath and with some exciting news about the fall lecture series. Um, it's that time of year when we start uh, having online lectures. And in our fall lecture series, we have a great lineup. In fact, you are all among the first to hear about this new lineup. Our lecture series will take place on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. from October 19th through November 16th. Our opening lecture will be none other than John Charles Duffy. And John will explore the historic hymns and community of Christ through the lens of material culture, uh, taking a look at the old hymns from the Restoration Movement as living, breathing artifacts. And it's gonna be a fascinating lecture. Our second lecture will include guest historian John Dinger, and John will share his thoughts on the life and legacy of William Marks. Uh, Marks you learned about during John's lecture today, John Hamer's lecture. William Marks served as the Nauvoo State President in the 1840s, and later as a member of the First Presidency in the Reorganization under Joseph Smith III. So we'll learn more about that uh, in that second lecture in the lecture series. While our third presentation will be led by the fabulous Kristen Mackay. Kristen will share her thoughts on Frederick Madison Smith's time in Salt Lake City from 1904 through 1906. Fred moved his entire family to Salt Lake City, and Kristen will detail the Smith family's experience out west, in addition to showing us a number of rare, rarely seen Smith family photos and artifacts uh, from this period and more. It's gonna be a great lecture. And our final lecture in the fall series will feature our friends Nancy Ross and David Howlett. Uh, these two will explore the development of RLDS feminist activism in the 1970s, and they're going to trace the evolution of RLDS feminism from small consciousness raising groups in the late 1960s all the way to the more formal advocacy and 
educational organizations in the 1970s. So friends, you can be among the first to register for this exciting series by following the registration link that Peter is going to drop in the chat box if he hasn't done it already. It's really going to be a great autumn lecture season. So we hope you'll be able, be able to join us. And that's all the exciting fall series news I have today from the Historic Sites Foundation. Hopefully we've given John enough time to recover from his presentation. He's provided us with a lot of information over the last hour and a half. And I'd like to welcome back, John. Um, now's the time when we open up the floor for questions from our audience. So friends, do you have any questions related to today's topic and what you've heard from John in his presentation? All right. So we have had a couple uh, comments and questions from the Center Place YouTube channel. And so uh, Evan Charlie uh, makes a note when I was talking about the decanization of DNC 116, which is to say the, uh, the be not hasty in ordaining men of the Negro race, uh, that he points out, or she points out that, that this was not voted down. Uh, it was actually referred to the first presidency. I sort of, um, that's yes, technically true. I think that it also means that it was kind of voted down. <laughs> so I think the sentiment there was that, yes, we will re refer that to the first presidency. But we, I think maybe, I think that this is my recollection of it. I, I think that that's, you are correct. But I also think that my recollection of it was that, uh, that, that folks did not want to see it removed. Uh, do we have question, Barb, do you have questions? We do. I have a question from Justice Manning. And yes. Justice asks, why has this history not been used in the past to present the, quote, true history? You may have answered this, and sorry I was late to arriving. Um, so, so why has this not been presented in the past? I, like I say, actually, there, it, depend, you ha it was presented in the past, depending on if you were willing to go, um, go look for it. So uh, I mentioned that already Bob Flanders wrote a book at the beginning, essentially, of the New Mormon history period, um, you know, which is to say Nauvoo Kingdom on the Mississippi. And so this was brought to us uh, all the way back then, but you had to go and read it. And so this was, um, uh, there was a bad reaction to that. So uh, members of the RLDS Church at the time, lots of them did not receive that book well, and Bob Flanders, uh, was not made to feel welcome. He ultimately uh, ceased to be active in the church, and it was only uh, when I got involved in JWHA that he even came back and started being engaged in the history uh, organization again. Um, there was a lot in the whole course of the RLDS uh, fighting, uh, interchurch fighting of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Um, there was, uh, this was known to a bunch of the people, and it was not known to others, and ultimately uh, the church has never made this its focus. So although uh, the church historian, Richard Howard, uh, published a seminal um, uh, work on the historiography, historiography of this, he still had a very cautious and nuanced view, and the First Presidency also was heavily uh, pressuring him not to say more than he said when that was published in Restoration Studies. And so, in fact, it was Barb's and mine and David Howlett's book, A Community of Christ and Illustrated History, in 2010. That is the first book ever published by Harold House uh, that just admits the historical reality uh, that Joseph Smith Jr. is the originator of polygamy, and we also use the historically defensible story that William Marks and Emma originally told uh, that he thought better of it, he tried to repent, he knew it was going to destroy the church, but it was too late and it did destroy the church. Um, so this has not been a focus since. I think that, um, like even if we listen to what Grant McBurry uh, said in his reflections, that he member, the leadership of the church didn't want to fight over this and hoped it would go away. <laughs> Um, but unfortunately it has not gone away. And so why I felt the need to talk about it is that if we ever do talk about this, which is just, in my opinion, like background history uh, on Beyond the Walls or in our church services or in my lectures, I will get um, 
reactions from wonderful members of the church who don't believe this because they haven't been informed about the historical consensus here um, and because the church hasn't been talking about it. So that's why I think we still need to talk about it. We have another question uh, from Makoto. And Makoto asks, one question I have is about how we understand Joseph Smith III as pragmatic, as he has often been called. His strategy seems relatively consistent across projects, averting his position and demurring on contrary engagement until rivals died or left. This is what he did for both contested scripture, like the Book of Abraham, as well as polygamy. With it having been unpragmatic on polygamy, what made the strategy pragmatic for other points of dispute? Right, that's a good, um, a good point. Um, so, so yes, I, I agree with you that he's doing the same tactic uh, and, uh, and having the same kind of strategy. And the reason why I think it was pragmatic for um, getting rid of things like the Book of Abraham or outliving certain other distinctions that weren't um, as important is that that those actually were fine to do, those positions were all fine to take. They didn't have any really negative consequences and they actually helped the church get to a place where we're not sitting around stuck with um, the book of Abraham in our canon, which is a very problematic book. So it's not something that we would necessarily want to have in the, in the canon and have to be defending and all that sort of thing. Um, the reason why, um, I guess I'm considering this position on polygamy uh, not, and specifically not opposing polygamy, that's fine. His position, um, uh, his position that his father had nothing to do with polygamy as unpragmatic is because it's specifically false. So he is, is actively promoting something that people knew was false, everybody knew was false, and that has left, left the, ended up leaving the church wounded as a result of that. Um, and so, and so, and, it, and he was pushing it harder than everybody else, as opposed to simply being like in a faction. It's it's almost entirely all him that we we got to this unfortunate place that we got to. So that's why I'm calling it that way. Maybe it's a I can I can see why I can see your complaint though in how I'm using the term. So. Our next question comes from Charles Greenberg, and Charles says. I understand that there is no DNA evidence of Joseph Smith Jr. offspring other than through Emma. Is this true? Charles, that's my understanding too. Um, I haven't been reading up on any, any testing that's occurred like any time more recently than five years ago or something like that. But as far as I know, the last time I read any, any of these, uh, none of the uh, women who were married privately to Joseph Smith, who believed that they had children by Joseph Smith, uh, many of whom were already married to other people, and so other men, and so um, it's been, been shown, I think, in many of the tests that some of those kids that they thought were his, maybe, or might be his, were not his. So, um, so we don't have any uh, Joseph Smith Jr. offspring out other than by Emma and descendants, but that doesn't mean that we don't have um, all of the marriages. We have the marriages, and indeed, we have um, count, uh, testimony from many, many of the women that, uh, that the relationship was not simply spiritual, that, there was, uh, that, that it was physical. And so even in the context of the Victorian era, where they wouldn't want to testify about that, um, nevertheless, in the Temple Lot suit, for example, women did testify to that effect that there was a physical relationship. And indeed, the fact that some of these women thought that the child was Joseph Smith's, even if it wasn't, um, uh, anyway, tells us not that, it does tell us we don't have any offspring, it doesn't tell us there was no relationship. We have a question from Bruce Nelson. Uh, Bruce says, thank you for your faithful work on this topic, John. Do you see Joseph Smith III's influence in the community of Christ today, increasing emphasis on environmental justice? Thanks, Bruce. Um, I do hope so. We definitely, um, as, uh, as our focus on peace has continued to become ever more central and has also been evolving, one of the more recent formulations that we have uh, 
um, when we talk about peace is we talk about peace on and for the earth. And a major focus in Community of Christ is that we really can't have, we can't pursue peace. We can't have peace until there is also uh, an awareness that um, just the destructive uh, uh, components of all of the ways that we are destroying our environment everywhere, uh, up to and including obviously the dangers of, of catastrophic climate change, are themselves a, a root cause of, of war and will continue to be um, as uh, water and food and everything become ever more scarce in all kinds of components of the planet. Um, unless we have environmental justice, we are not going to see any other kind of justice and peace. And so in the same way that um, Joseph III um, really set us, I think, on this peace path, and we see that as fully entwined with environmental justice, I do absolutely think that that um, is relevant. We have a question on our end, I think, from the... Uh, okay, it's all the same. So anyway, maybe Barb can read them or I can, but anyway, Leon Berg wrote, he said, did the letter to the Whitney's, was the letter to the Whitney's in Joseph Smith's hand, did the Whitney revelation also in his hand that accompanied the letter? Do we have those documents? So those documents are part of the Joseph Smith Papers Project that are held by uh, the LDS Church there online, so you can read them. Um, I reviewed them even this morning, or maybe yesterday when I was, uh, when I was looking at it. Uh, the, the letter is in Joseph Smith's hand. It's a letter to the, the family that's saying, don't, don't come if Emma's around and everything like that, but otherwise, please come, please come. That, that one is in Joseph Smith's hand. The revelation about them being a wife, this is something that Joseph Smith dictated and Newell K. Whitney wrote in his hand. So we have those, those documents. They're online and you can see them. We have a second question from Leon, and Leon asks, did Joseph III's personal view on his father's alleged polygamy also influence his interactions with his sibling, David Hiram? I have read somewhere that David Hiram, when in Utah on his mission, became very troubled by the living witnesses to their father's relationships. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, like I say, ultimately, the, the, the amount of evidence here is so total, including all of the living witnesses um, who wouldn't have probably testified, who wouldn't have come forward, who wouldn't have told about all of this personal stuff, had not Joseph III taken this very contrarian and clearly false position. And so as a result of that, um, everybody was talking about it. And so David Hiram and also uh, Alexander were both sent to Utah on missions to the West, to Utah. And like you say, um, you know, whereas Joseph III was able to dig in his heels and just be willfully blind to this evidence and potentially we, don't, we can't know his inner mind if, if he was just ultimately being dishonest or if he was simply deceiving himself entirely. Um, but David Hiram couldn't do that. And, um, and certainly uh, there's an, an excellent biography of David Hiram, which is called From Mission to Madness. So David Hiram um, uh, did, uh, you know, did have a mental health condition and ended up having to um, uh, be institutionalized ultimately. And, and that was potentially one of the things that destabilized him, this disconnect, um, you know, and also not being able to maintain um, this. So I think it may have been one of the, one of the wounds that um, I was talking about that we need healing all the way back to the beginning. We have a question from Gwendolyn Hawks Blue and Gwen asks, I have not finished reading Mark Shear's three volumes of church history, but do you know if Mark's work corresponds with your findings? Hi Gwendolyn. Um, yes. Uh, so, so Mark, uh, absolutely is one, you know, is a legitimate historian, incredible historian. And so like all, all credible historians agrees that Joseph Smith Jr. is engaged in the practice of polygamy. Mark is also um, among, as it was also an official church historian and is among um, the most pastoral uh, people and pastoral historians. Um, and he was writing those books in a way that he is able to 
show evidence while, um, while allowing church members to draw their own conclusions. So he was not, uh, uh, you know, since it, he wasn't making it an official history of the church, but because there was a fear that it would be read as an official history of the church, um, Mark was very nuanced and pastoral in how he um, drew, drew conclusions in this section. And so it, the conclusion is obvious, um, but uh, for example, the Community of Christ's uh, principles of history uh, as a church, we do not take official positions on historical conclusions. So even if there is a historical consensus, like for example, the moon landing did happen, it wasn't faked, or the Holocaust did happen, we don't, we don't take an official position. That's for historians to decide. And um, Mark, I think with encouragement of the presidency, also wrote his, uh, his history to allow people to draw their own conclusions. Next question is from Jim Burdick from San Antonio, Texas. And Jim asks, when groups were reabsorbed, were they usually rebaptized or re-recognized when joining the reorganization? Yeah, Jim, the, um, the reorganization, the new organization had at its, um, as bedrock, that we are not a different church. We are, not a, we are the church. All of the factions, Brigham Young's church and everything like that, those are all offshoots of us. We're the same church, is, uh, is our conceit. That's, uh, that's the claim that we had in the RLDS Church Community of Christ. It would be, therefore, our position was, therefore, um, it, would, it doesn't make any sense to rebaptize anybody. And so, so rebaptism was anathema, in fact, in the reorganization. So people did not have to get rebaptized, but rather they were recognized as members on the strength of their original baptism. And indeed, this was a, um, because rebaptism or spiritual baptism, baptism for healing and so forth, had become a, a, a spiritual practice, sort of like having communion, uh, in other words, something that you do more than once out in Utah. And indeed, because people, when they entered uh, the Great Basin, they were usually rebaptized in going there, then the reorganized church would say, oh, ha ha, see, that shows that it's, Brigham Young has a new church, that we're the original church. We don't have to be rebaptized. So, so specifically, it's not even usually they were n never <laughs> rebaptized. I mean, it would, the only exception to that would be if there would have been some group that would have been functioning and their priesthood was somehow was not recognized as going back to the original church, then you might have to have a baptism because your priesthood wasn't, didn't count or something like that. Question from Michael. From whom did Isaac Sheen learn that Joseph Jr. repudiated polygamy before his death? So Isaac Sheen learned that from William Marks. So Isaac Sheen is an opponent of polygamy because he um, caught uh, William practicing it. Uh, and, and so, but in terms of Isaac Sheen is not uh, one of the main uh, insiders in Nauvoo like William Marks. There were other um, uh, Nauvoo insiders who were aware of Joseph Smith's polygamy who ended up in the reorganization. Um, but Isaac Sheen is learning about it because William Marks is writing him in the newspaper. We have a follow-up question from Ron Wagner, and Ron asks, did Joseph Smith Jr.'s brother that was killed with him also practice polygamy? Yeah, so Hiram um, also practiced polygamy, yes. And so um, uh, uh, Hiram is initially, so Joseph Smith introduces polygamy to a whole circle of folks in Nauvoo, and Hiram hears a rumor about it. Hiram is not in that group originally. Hiram hears a rumor about it, and he's quite against it initially, and he thinks that it's being practiced again, you know, by people who are not uh, you know, his brother or whatever, as he's heard this kind of rumor. Um, and he even, uh, he even talked to my great-great-great-uncle Benjamin Winchester, who was also an opponent of polygamy and things like that, and he, at the time that Hiram was against it, they were allied with each other. Later, um, uh, later though, Hiram uh, talked, confronted Joseph Smith about it and was convinced by Joseph Smith of its truth. And in part, then Joseph Smith converted him in part because he, uh, uh, he dictated that revelation so that Hiram could also uh, 
convince Emma to come on board with it. And so Hiram did also enter into polygamous marriages in secret uh, at the time. And so, for example, when um, Joseph III went out to Utah, his cousin, uh, Joseph F. Smith, was assigned to preach against him. And Joseph F. Smith is the son of Hiram Smith. And so uh, the Gentile uh, newspapers noted, because the, one of the main um, uh, points of evidence that Joseph the third had was all of the public statements that Hiram and Joseph, the public denials that they printed in the Times and Seasons. And so Joseph the uh, third read those. And then Joseph F. Smith got up and explained that uh, his fa why, why his father and Joseph Jr. had been lying and all of the evidence that they'd been lying. And the Gentiles out in Utah were very, were very pleased because they more or less said in the newspaper. And so yeah, Joseph F. Smith proved that his father was a liar. <laughs> Uh, and so forth. But in any event, yes. So the answer to that uh, is yes, that Hiram uh, was uh, also a polygamist. Well, we have a nice comment submitted by Elaine and what appears to be our final question from Makoto. Uh, but first, Elaine Turner says, thank you for this wonderful presentation, John. For someone who struggles with history on every subject, you helped me understand so much more than I did prior to listening to your presentation. Blessings. And lastly, the question from Makoto. Makoto writes, thank you for your thoughtful Q&A answers. I'm curious about your closing comments about Joseph III and westward members of the restoration movements. Do you, do you mean you think historical untenability was the primary stumbling block against Utah saints moving to the reorganization? What of the theological differences that plurality entailed and the lived religion that practitioners believed they experienced? Right. Um, so I believed that Joseph III's false position on his father undercut people's believing in him as a prophet. But this is maybe going back to also that question about how do I mean this was pragmatic or not? And so his other point on polygamy that it wasn't pragmatic is that, yes, I think that what he could have done is if people there generally started recognizing him as a prophet and he had some kind of way where he didn't let's just say, all I want to say is polygamy is a morally reprehensible, polygamy is wrong, polygamy should be stopped. If he instead had some kind of a pragmatic thing to realize, well, look, all of these people, this is now their families. They are totally intertwined in this condition of this thing. And even if uh, we decide that, uh, religious polygyny is inherently sexist and, and, uh, and causes uh, the female condition to be unequal and so forth, and so therefore is something that should be uh, eradicated, uh, you still have to real, realize the practical lived experience like you're talking about. And so, and so if he had some kind of a pragmatic, nuanced position that helps people you know, okay, you're there. You know, there was the kind of position, frankly, that um, the community of Christ, that the RLDS church took uh, when starting to bring um, uh, people who were living polygamous, uh, in polygamous marriages in India and Africa in the 1970s. Um, there was a pragmatic idea there that, yes, you can be, become members, you just simply cannot enter into new marriages and so forth. In other words, ex understanding that this is part of uh, your lived experience, even if we're not going to continue to promote it or make it be part of the, a positive part of the religion. So what I'm suggesting is, yes, if he was pragmatic on that and he hadn't undercut his own prophetic, um, uh, his own claims to the prophetic mantle, that he could have attracted lots of people out west, even if they were polygamous. The Whiteites were polygamous. They all joined, you know, the the uh, reorganization, uh, the Cutlerites had given it up, but they kind of joined. There were people who were willing, the Strangites had been polygamous, although not in great numbers. So, so it wasn't only, um, uh, this wasn't a, a thing that kept you from joining the reorganization necessarily, but in this particular case out in Utah, I think it was. And that's one of the things I guess I think is unpragmatic. There's maybe been a couple more questions while I was answering questions, Barb. <laughs> Are you seeing these? I don't have any in the queue here. Perhaps okay, so they're on these some. sides. So from, this is from my side. So let me, let me answer some of the ones. So Helen Sutton has written here, did Joseph Smith Jr. believe in plural marriage? 
I've never believed he did. Now, if he did, does that mean the whole church in my more than 80 years has been misrepresented? I have been passionate in my belief. Now, where do I go? So the church is not wrong. The church has been, for your whole 80 years, opposed to plural marriage. Um, Joseph Smith III was opposed to plural marriage. Joseph Smith Jr., in the last months of his life, believed that in introducing plural marriage into the church, he had committed a terrible error and a sin that was going to destroy the church. Um, there's no place that you need to go. We are in the same place that you've been this entire time. We are now aware of additional historical information. Um, as I was talking about with the Apostle Peter, who denied Christ three times, that doesn't mean we have to not follow Christianity that has passed to us through Peter. Um, King David committed horrible abuses of his authority and was forgiven by God. So it's not for us to worship past leaders. Um, Joseph Smith was a human being. He committed abuses of his authority. Um, that's not, we don't have to, you don't have to consider him, you don't have to judge him as a, a fallen prophet or not. That's up to God. Uh, the church goes on regardless of um, the failings of the human beings that make it up. Uh, Evan Charlie writes, how uh, could the church heal from polygamy today, especially since the church was in denial of it for so long and in some ways still is, how do we move forward? Evan, this is why I thought it was important for me to, to, to speak on it and this address today. So in other words, we don't talk about this enough. We have had kind of an official policy, I think, for the past um, 40 years of trying to kind of put the information out there, but then uh, wonderful members who were listening today who have just heard this for the first time, even though um, historians 100% concluded this 40 years ago. This is just known, but they haven't been told that. And so that is a failing on the part of the church, and that has caused us to, to not heal. So we have sort of pretended we've been open about this by letting all of our historians say it and publishing it in our wonderful JWHA journal or restoration studies or places where we aren't seeing it. But we have to, we have to work through this as a people and we have to understand um, that the church from the beginning actually had a correct and historically defensible narrative about this topic. And we need to start there so that we can move forward. Uh, so we have about 90 people watching on YouTube. Most of them do not actually come from the RLDS or LDS tradition. So Leandro asks, what would I say to them as they are beginning to learn about all of our church today and this difficult chapter in our history? Well, I'll just say thank you for tuning in to what has been a very, uh, in, <laughs> you know, you know we, we're really talking kind of uh, in the weeds in our tradition. And so I appreciate that you've given us the time and attention to talk ab about these things. Um, so this is a complicated and not our favorite part of our history that we, for us to talk about. And we, as you've even seen in the discussions in the Q&A, this is something that we haven't been talking about very well. Um, and so, so thank you for bearing with us in terms of the airing of some of this dirty laundry, but I also hope what it'll say to, to you is that um, our willingness to engage these things, to live stream it and op be open in our discussions, uh, hopefully says something about our aspirations anyway as a people to be willing to um, engage with our tradition with honesty and integrity. And so I thank you for joining us. I thank uh, Liberty Hall. I thank uh, the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. Thank you, John. Uh, it's time for us to, um, to bring our third annual Joseph Smith III's Peace Lecture to a close. And I'd just like to thank John and those who are kind of more, be well, and Barbara, those who are kind of more behind the scenes, Peter and Leandro, and each of you who are listening uh, for being with us and uh, sharing in this, in this historical Heritage Day presentation. We thank you and thank you for your supporting support of the Community of Christ Historic Sites, and we hope you have a blessed day. Amen.
record.